Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Friends Room at Columbia Public Library. We are glad you are here. It shows that you want to participate in the in the important matters of this community. So thank you very much. My name is David Lyle, and it is my privilege to be able to help out with the League of Women Voters event again tonight. League of Women Voters of Columbia and Boone County Candidate and Issue Forum. The League is pleased to work with the Columbia Public Library and also with Lauren Williams and the way she helps to host this forum and gets all the audio and technical things that we have right here within this room taken care of. And then thanks to KFRU and to KOPN for airing this forum on their radio stations. Tom Holmes is in the back and we appreciate the uh, work that he does also to make sure that those who cannot be here in person are able to participate in listening through the radio. At this forum, we're going to cover a lot of um, territory over the next hour and a half plus. You're going to hear from the candidates for the Columbia School Board, the Columbia City Council, Ward 2, Ward 1 recall, and learn about the Boone County ballot issue. We request that you uh, participate, but do so in an orderly manner so that the radio audience doesn't hear a lot of commotion here. We'll be, yeah, we will be taking breaks in between each of the segments of tonight's forum so that the um, stations can do some advertising or announcements and then also we can change the, the front area here. So we are going to uh, also time, we have timers at the front, so those who are going to be participating in the forum part will know how they are doing in regard to the time uh, parameters that we have established for tonight. I'm not going to take any more time other than just to get right into the very first Part of our evening, our first part of the forum is going to be an explanation of the Ward 1 recall. Before this recall was put on the April 2nd ballot, people in Ward 1 who uh, were behind the recall effort had to get verified signatures of 30% of voters in the last Ward 1 City Council election. These signatures were presented to the City Council and the City Council placed the recall call question on the April 2nd ballot. So tonight we have a representative of the Ward 1 recall. And we also have the council person. They have each been given five minutes to speak tonight and to present their side. And that is going to be our presentation of this particular issue. So let's start with the um, with the recall effort first. Uh, Susan Mays is here, and uh, we'd like to hear your five minute presentation. Well, okay, hope I won't be five minutes. <laughs> um, I wanted to preface this by saying that the first ward is unique. We're the youngest ward, we're the poorest ward. We have more students than anyone. We are dense, we're walkable, and all the things the city prioritizes. Um, we're under pressure from the development community and the realtors and have been for 20 plus years that I'm aware of to become more dense and replace our single family homes with high rise apartments, primarily for student housing. And so it's made us all a little bit sensitive to these kinds of issues. So when our first ward rep took a job lobbying for the Missouri Realtor, it gave us pause. Uh, and some people contacted him and asked what was going on. And they were told that there was nothing to see here. There was absolutely nothing wrong with what was going on. And we should just move along. Well, some of us were not pleased about that. So we met with some of our neighbors in backyards across the ward in different areas and tried to find out what we could do about this. And the only real option or a, a conversation that we couldn't in, find anyone to engage with us on, a recall was our, really our only option. So we collected 421 signatures, 350 or so of them were considered first ward voters. We did this in six weeks over a holiday. This was not a difficult thing to get signatures on. None of us are, um, the initial signature gathering was performed by just first ward and likely things. There's others that gave advice, but we were all just talking to our neighbors for the most part. Um, so one of the, um, so that is why we're here. That's why we did it the way we did it. We're especially sensitive to development pressures. And I'm happy to take any questions. Maybe. Um, <laughs> we're not actually planning on this. I'm following the rules of the League of Women Voters, yeah. but uh, 
We'll see after the uh, presentation by the council mm -hmm. person who holds the board one seat there. We'll probably end it shortly after that. But Nick Canoth, you're the city council person. You're on the, it is only for ward one to vote on this recall effort. You'll either say, yes, I want him recalled or no, I do not. Nick, your comments, please. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, and I appreciate Susan being here to represent the recall um, effort. So when I changed jobs back in, I think September, which I think it's important to keep in mind that that is why the recall effort is happening, is because I changed day jobs, uh, not because of any stance or vote I've taken as in my capacity as a council person that first ward voters find uh, offensive or not in line with uh, their policy priorities. It's about what I do for a living and what I have done. Uh, I was I had been a lobbyist before being elected to office. I was attacked on that when I ran for for office, uh, and I am a lobbyist now. Uh, there's been no lack of transparency in that. I work for the Missouri Realtors, a statewide a nonprofit association that advocates for uh, the American dream, which is our logo in terms of getting folks, you know, more homes for more people. Uh, when I had two people email me uh, the week that I updated my LinkedIn, <laughs> I responded and said, this is what I do for a living. Uh, this is how it is not a conflict of interest. This is what a conflict of interest is which for those who might be unsure or confused by that, uh, I would have to, or my employer would have to have some uh, direct interest or benefit from votes that I take. Uh, and as I have none in that case, and neither does my employer because they operate at the statewide level, uh, which is separate from our local government, uh, there is no conflict of interest. That is not my opinion. Uh, that is the decision made by both the city's legal counsel and the Missouri Ethics Commission who is responsible for things of that nature. Uh, those things were taken into account prior to me switching positions because I'm conscious, uh, as anyone would be in elected office, of ensuring that boundaries are respected and laws are followed. I value and respect the rights of my my first ward neighbors and citizens to share their concerns on any subject, including this. I am disappointed that it went from we'd like to know more to we're going to recall you if you don't quit your job. Uh, there was not a request to meet despite my offers to, uh, and here we are now, which is unfortunate. I've always worked, I believe, diligently to represent the first ward's interest. Uh, I believe I've been successful in doing so. You know, my, just in my first year, we have made significant strides on a number of issues, including you know, regulating short-term rentals to protect our neighborhoods, uh, advocating for our LGBTQ neighbors, uh, and emboldening our neighborhood services department when it comes to neighborhood cleanup, something that's also important to our ward and more. But again, I've only been here one year, not perhaps not too much to judge me on, frankly. That being said, you know, progress cannot exist without unity. Uh, we don't have to have unanimity, but we do need to be united. Uh, and I am concerned that regardless of the outcome of this recall, uh, short of it being a landslide in one direction or the other, that the most impactful thing it will have done is create division, uh, as can be represented by just driving down any of our streets and you see competing yard sides flanking each other and uh, a number of things and things I've heard anecdotally. Despite the recall, I remain focused on re representing the first ward. Uh, I continue to make progress there, whether it's, it's in establishing a affordable housing trust fund or the Office of Violence Prevention and working with my council colleagues. Should the recall effort succeed, however, uh, I believe it's important for folks to have context uh, beyond just what I do for a living uh, in their decision making. The first ward, if I'm recalled, will not only have no representation for at least four and a half months on city council, uh, but it will be during an incredibly important decision-making period. Uh, the final deliberations for the West Ash Street Improvement Project will take place. And perhaps more importantly, the deliberations for the once every 10 years capital improvement sales tax uh, will occur. Uh, for those who don't know, that is where council decides what goes on the ballot and what major infrastructure improvements for each ward occur for the next decade. Uh, and so that will have decades of impact on our community uh, and would hate to have the first ward, regardless of the fact that I'm in this position, uh, lose its voice during that time. Again, only happens once every 10 years. All that being said, I do urge the first ward to, and ask them, judge me on the quality of my service, my record of accomplishments, however few they may be, given it's only been a year, and my unwavering, de unwavering dedication to the priorities and beliefs we hold dear. 
Together, let us continue to push for progress, unity, and transparency. And those are not just uh, slogans on my yard signs. It's the cornerstone of uh, my time in office and what I strive for. Uh, so I do ask uh, that the first ward vote no on April 2nd uh, and help unite the ward and not divide it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quino. Since you did not take your full five minutes, I'm going to give you just an opportunity, a short opportunity to summarize what it is that worries you most about him continuing on as the city council then. Um, Part of his job description is coordinate statewide programs and activities among low school associations. This is not about division. This is an election. It is an election that we are all neighbors. I have had conversations with neighbors, both pro Nick and pro recall. Nobody's fighting about them. I'm not having any arguments about it. Most of us are not having any arguments about it. We have what we perceive to be a disconnect and an inability to get any answers beyond boilerplate, which is what sparked this recall. The city attorney does not seem to recognize some um, conflicts of interest. Owning a short-term rental does not disqualify a voter, a council person from voting on it. How is that something that we can trust as citizens of the first ward? What does that mean? Who's looking out for us? And how do we make that situation better in the future? I think it needs to be, we need to be responsive to our, our um, constituents. Okay. Thank hey, you. Can I clarify real quick? You, do you have a short-term rental? No, I, that's what I want to clarify. I do not own a short-term rental. She, yeah. she, she's referring to a different council person, okay. which I knew. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure everyone else knows that because not everyone uh, uh, follows council as intensely as her and I do. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to give you that chance to clarify that. I didn't think she did. All right. Nick Minot is currently the city council person for Ward 1. Susan Mays represents the organization or the neighbors who would like to see him recalled. If you're in Ward 1, you'll have that chance to vote yes or no on April 2nd. Thank you both for being here. We'll take a two-minute break and change the front for our city council candidates.
Women Voters Forum tonight. We're at the Fringe Room at Columbia Public Library. Before we go into our next segment, let me make a helpful uh, clarification of voting, which I appreciate one of the audience members here at the library saying, April 2nd is the election day, but nowadays you can vote prior to that, no excuse absentee voting. So if you wanna get that ballot in earlier, you are free to do so. And uh, I think like I have here, my handy little sample ballot that came from the county clerk will explain all that you need to do, although I didn't bring that part of the mail. But you can uh, you can vote anytime leading up to April 2nd, so I appreciate that. And uh, also, um, my daughter who lives out in Montana just told me today that she went and had her ballot notarized so that she could uh, get it sent in. What's that, Marilyn? These are some cards that give information. Cards that give information on it are out, out in the entry area also. The other thing I want to say about cards, you have index cards on the seats. And if you have a question that you want to have for these candidates for the city council position, or if you would like to uh, have a question later on when we have the school board candidates up here, write down your question, raise it up, and one of the members of the League of Women Voters will bring it up to the front. Also, if you're listening tonight on uh, the Zoom presentation for the League of Women Voters and you want to ask a question, you can do so. Put your question in the chat function of your conversation and that will be handed to me also. This next portion of the forum is going to be for Ward 2 candidates. And we also would like to recognize the Ward 6 council person who is running unopposed. Betsy Peters was just here. I And she, I think, standing outside. If you want to talk with the Ward 6 council person, feel free to do so. She told me earlier she is giving up bridge night in order to be here tonight. So make it worth her while and yours by talking to Betsy Peters from Ward 6. Uh, the league doesn't have a section for unopposed candidates. I think that's uh, that makes sense to me. But we do have a, a, we have three candidates running for one position in Ward 2. And one of these three candidates that are at the front table right now is going to be a new member of the city council after the votes are tallied. The candidates for Ward 2 are Robert Schreiber, Lisa Meyer, and the certified write-in candidate, Lucio Batoy. Columbia has seven members of the city council. Six are representatives of wards. One is the mayor. Each council member serves a three-year staggered term. Each year, two ward seats are up for election, and every third year, the mayor is up for election. This year, Ward 2 and Ward 6 council persons are up for election, as I just described. Ward 6 is unopposed, so it'll be a re-election there. I'm seeing that Betsy Peters will likely get at least one vote. The uh, candidates on the April 2nd ballot are presented in ballot order. Robert Schreiber and Lisa Meyer, Lucio Batoy, certified write-in candidate. And uh, you will need to write in his name if you're in Ward 2 and want to vote for him. A write-in candidate is certified by completing a declaration of intent at the county clerk's office. Each candidate is going to have a two-minute time period for opening statements. A one-minute closing statement will ask the three candidates questions also. Don't forget the note cards if you want to ask a question here or the chat part of the Zoom. And uh, we will have those questions and get to as many as we can. We're scheduled to end this portion of our forum tonight around 7.15. So candidates are going to have their two-minute opening statements. As I said, it's as the order is on the ballot. Robert Schreiber, welcome. And we'll take your opening statement. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Robert Schreiber III running for City Council Second Ward. I was born and raised here in Boone County. Grew up uh, out by the Mark Twain National Forest. Went to school in Ashland and moved to Columbia about 20 years ago. I uh, started construction when I was 17 years old and worked with that same group for the next 20 years. After that, I had my own construction business, which I ran for about two years. We specialized in building passive solar earth contact energy efficient housing. Um, Currently, I am a maintenance man at the University of Missouri, where I take care of 218 apartments, which keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> but if elected, I want to work on some uh, some basic issues. I want us to uh, work on affordable housing, which is a problem across the city and across the country and across the world, for that matter. Um, I want to keep updating our public infrastructure, uh, make sure that we have good working roads, sewers, bridges, electric lines. Uh, we got to fix what's old bring it up to date, and we have to build a, the new infrastructure with regards to the future generations and make sure that it lasts. 
Finally, I'd like to work on public transportation. I think the city needs to bring back our bus system uh, that to serve our citizens that don't have cars, the elderly and anyone that wants to ride the bus, right? We want people to get to work so that they can pay taxes and that helps the city also. Um, I also wanna make sure that we transition into a greener economy, right? We wanna be off uh, fossil fuels, preferably by 2035. I'd like to see 80% by 2030. Um, being a home builder that specialized in that, I think I can help in that regard. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Schreiber. Lisa Meyer, you're all state. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my father was first generation American Italian. I spent most of my childhood and adolescence in Illinois, initially on a farm and later in the St. Louis Metro East. I'm proud to say that I'm the first of my family to earn a college degree, which I achieved working full time and attending classes at night. I have over 10 years of experience in healthcare as well as in philanthropy for the arts. And I was a series seven and uh, 66 licensed financial advisor. I've been married to my husband, Jim, for over 20 years. For over a decade, I have worked as a small business owner in the real estate ed industry. Although I'm not originally from Columbia, I have lived in Ward 2 since 2005, and I consider it home. I love and I passionately promote our ward. Um, I'm meeting with Ward 2 residents and asking what matters to them. Now, many of you already know I'm a huge parks and rec fan. Okay, it's just out there. <laughs> Uh, we've got Albert Oakland, Bear Creek Trail, Cosmo, LA, uh, Nichols Golf Course. We have bragging rights. But sadly, um, I, when I'm out meeting people, they don't feel safe in our parks and even more don't feel safe on our trails. Um, others shared their stories about auto theft and having their cars broken into. Others mentioned crumbling sidewalks and there not being enough street lights. In general, many Ward 2 members feel a significant disconnect between their concerns and what's happening at City Hall. I believe that Ward 2 deserves a council representative dedicated to bringing our ward together. I'm not just dedicated, I'm passionate. I'm honored to have been endorsed by many wonderful people like David Ballinger, Debbie Lacey Anderson, the Columbia Board of Realtors, and the Columbia Police Officers Association. Let's work together to make Ward 2 a safer, healthier, and happier place. Vote for Lisa on Tuesday, April the 2nd. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. Lucio Batoy, your open statement, please, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? All right, so uh, my name is Lucio Batoy IV. I am a writing candidate for city council. Uh, I am a political scientist by way of Lincoln University. Um, I also interned with the Missouri House of Representatives uh, and started a pre-law program at Lincoln University to help HBCU students get prep for uh, law school, basically. Um, professionally, I uh, work here in the city at Columbia Boone County Public, Public Health and Human Services as a community relations specialist. Um, and I currently work at the Department of Social Services as a benefit benefit technician, just helping people get public assistance. Uh, so their mobile health med, uh, SNAP, EBT, stuff like that. Um, I'm running because I'm motivated by the material conditions of the people in this city, by people in this ward. Um, I'm running because of the rampant disparities in Colombia that go unaddressed. Um, I'm running because uh, I frankly see people that want to put themselves in power rather than in service, and I find it uncomfortable. Um, I'm running because things like women are still paid 86 cents on the dollar in Colombia, uh, because Black infant mortality is three times that of white children in Colombia, because Black household income is 62% of that of white income in Colombia. Um, and to address these things, um, I believe that it can be a, approached at the same time through uh, anti-poverty, uh, which would I would phrase honestly economic democracy, um, affordable housing, ecological restoration, and targeting these, these disparities directly. Um, to that end, I would like to either amend the 2024 budget to put more money into the affordable housing program that we already have in place. Uh, and also mobilize and organize the residents of the ward to, I'm sorry, uh, to put pressure on, you know, the department heads in places like the land trust to get the lead out, start developing new affordable land, uh, units that have permanent rent control. Uh, and you can finish your oh, I was gonna say, uh, and also there is a USDA forestation grant uh, that is uh, just out there. Uh, the deadline is the 26th. Um, Kansas City got $12 million for it last year. 
and St. Louis got $8 million for for just their reforestation pro, uh, programs. Uh, Columbia has not applied for that. Um, I'm currently working on that myself, trying to partner with organizations that are eco-minded to try to get that submitted on behalf of the city. Uh, but if elected, that's something I would submit on behalf of the city in 2025. We're going to start questions now. Thank you, Mr. Bethoy. We'll start questions and we'll rotate who goes first. And I'm going to ask a couple of the questions first that the League of Women Voters have compiled and put together that their league is concerned about. If you have questions, remember, write them down on your note card and raise that and we'll have someone collect those. And then also, I think we'll probably have some questions through the Zoom chat. We'll start with uh, Robert Shriver on this one. What are the most important issues facing your ward and how would you address them? I understand some of this was covered in opening statements, but let's go a little bit deeper on this. Yeah, um, affordable housing, right? I also want to work with the Columbia Land Trust and get more units out there on the market um, because the Columbia Land Trust can enact rent controls. Uh, statewide, we cannot enact. The state has preempted uh, rent controls on any city in, in the state. So I believe working with the land trust where we can have some rent controls is important. And I also want to build more uh, green, sustainable housing, right? We want to, we want these houses to be energy efficient, not only to take carbon out of the atmosphere, but to work on uh, utility bills. We don't want people paying all their money for utility bills if it's cheap. Um, public transportation, I want to bring the buses back. And I think the city wants to do that as well. So we got to do that to get people to where they need to go, grocery stores, work, pharmacies. I think that's, uh, I think all these things need to be done. And I want to work with the people of the second ward to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Meyer, what are the most important issues facing your ward and how would you address those? Um, the number one issue is safety. Um, and we have got to get a fully staffed uh, professional police department uh, in place. Uh, so the number one issue is safety. Um, it's everybody's safety. Everyone should feel comfortable and safe in their homes, no matter if they rent or if they own. Um, a couple of points about affordable housing. I always like to share that I grew up in a rental house. I didn't own a home until I became an adult. Um, so I understand how important it is that no matter if you rent or own, that you live in a safe place. Um, a couple of quick things that we can do. One is for chapter 29, we can take R1 zoning up to four. Right now, we only allow in certain areas, three unrelated persons to live in a home. We could bump that up to four, simplify the code. And then second, we could create a sliding scale for permit fees. Right now, if you build a $300,000 property or a $1 million property, the fees are the same. I think we need to have a sliding scale for permit fees. All right, thank you. Lucio Batoy, same question. What are the most important issues facing your ward and how would you address them? The most important issues facing the second ward as I see them are poverty, uh, affordable housing, uh, ecological restoration, and the socioeconomic disparities that we see in the second ward. Um, uh, the second ward is home to the second highest concentration of Black residents in Columbia. Um, so not having a an actual spelled out Black agenda or any Black policy points is frankly very telling about how certain individuals meet the priorities of the city. Um, in terms of the specifics on poverty, uh, I support Missouri Jobs and Justice's uh, initiative to get a $15 an hour minimum wage um, and for affordable housing. I would like to either amend the budget for 2024 or I would vote no on any 2025 budget that didn't allocate proper funding for affordable housing and community development. Uh, if elected, I would put in the application with the USDA uh, for their forestation program to do things like converting space, like spaces that, uh, like what we have on uh, Vandiver and Business Loop, where we have a Joe Mockins, that could be a school or a community farm or something like that. We have way more space in second ward dedicated to, frankly, capitalism and resource extraction than infusing resources into the community. Thank you. We'll go to the next question. We'll start with Lisa Meyer on this one. There are several questions that the league provided ahead of time to me, and then we've got two from the audience one on Zoom, one from the audience here that are going to deal with climate and, and the environment. And so um, I'm going to probably ask two or three questions along this line. I don't know how to combine them into one, but I'll start with Lisa Meyer. First of all, do you 
believe that we do have a problem with the climate change and our climate warming that is perhaps man or human um, impacted. We'll start with that. And then if you say yes or no to that, I'm going to ask you if you say yes. So what is Columbia's uh, chief challenge in dealing with that as a city? Okay, well, uh, it, so the first question is, if I understand it correctly, is climate human activity change. is that impacting the climate? And the answer is yes. And our uh, and our winters are warmer now. It's my understanding. Um, what to do about it? Well, we currently have the climate action plan that's currently in place, and every single project that the city does has to connect with the uh, climate action plan. So there is already a process in place. Uh, my heart growing up on a farm and in the St. Louis Metro East is connected with conservation, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and a piece of that is also really high quality water. I don't think we should just have EPA grade water. I think that we should have water that comes from our kitchen sink that doesn't require a reverse osmosis machine for it to be the highest quality water. Um, I grew up not too far from Monsanto, got an uncle who was in the chemical workers union. I'm well aware of the importance of taking good care of our land. Thank you. Lucille Batoy, same question to you, and I probably won't say it the exact same way, but uh, human activities impact on climate change. Where do, you, uh, where do you understand? What is your feeling about that? And then what would we do if your answer is yes, so we do have an issue? What would we do as a city? Uh, so, yes, humans are causing this. I believe the highest contributor to the uh, to uh, CO2 emissions might be the military, actually. Uh, fun fact. Um, maintaining all those uh, uh, freighters and jets causes a lot of pollution. Um, but anyway, specifically in terms of Columbia, uh, my platform actually calls for a 15% increase in the tree canopy and critical forest stands near focused watersheds. Uh, this would greatly contribute to protecting the water quality and quantity and provide the most critical public health and safety functions of the second ward. Uh, this can be funded in large part through the community forestry program through the USDA that I mentioned earlier. Um, I would also call for a 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. Uh, I would like to work with facility owners to cover 70% of their rooftops with solar panels or, or, or alternatively uh, procure renewable electricity from offsite sources when the building's location pre presents limitations. Uh, I would propose greenhouse gas limit, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission limits, sorry, uh, on commercial buildings larger than 10,000 square feet. Uh, for properties that exceeded uh, the carbon uh, neutral limits, there would be consequences like fines up to uh, let's say $150 per metric ton. Uh, and I would also call for implementing a green code, which would be a voluntary framework based on the International Green Construction Code. Uh, this would implement standards that are at least 10% more stringent uh, than the existing city codes. And those who opt, that, uh, who opt for the initiative would gain benefits like accelerated permitting for their projects. Robert Schreiber, same question to you about the human activity impacting our climate and then what Columbia can do about this. Absolutely, uh, human activity contributes to climate change. We've seen the evidence there for the past 40 years. Um, what we can do about it? Well, we can get more watts, more green energy watts on the grid. That is that is huge. And there is federal funding for that. Um, I would like to see some more solar, more wind. I'd like to see us be connected to the Grain Belt Initiative that would bring uh, many megawatts of wind power through Columbia. As a green home builder, I would like to see new construction uh, code standards be brought up to the 2024 uh, IECC uh, code book. Um, I was doing that for a long time before it was uh, before it was thought of. But uh, yeah, if we're going to, I want to update all of the old infrastructure of housing. Also, we need to give incentives to make our old houses and rental properties more energy efficient. That's that's taking carbon out of the air as well. Um, as far as uh, city city transportation, I wrote a, a proposal for the University of Missouri to transfer, make all fleet vehicles electric. I would like to do the same thing for the city. Um, and expanding the bus program helps us with getting cars off the roads and traffic. Um, I, I really like Lucio's idea about the uh, getting some grants for reforestation. 
I think that helps with the uh, urban heat island effect that we have in our, our, our city that impacts a lot of poor communities, right? Because they weren't planned out to have green spaces. We'll start with Lucia Batoy on this one, and it picks up on something that you've already said, but bear with me because I think that the league has done a, a good job of researching this particular issue. The world per capita carbon dioxide footprint is 4.66 metric tons. U.S. per capita carbon dioxide footprint is 14.4 metric tons. The Como per capita carbon dioxide footprint is 19 metric tons. So it goes from four and two thirds to 14, almost and a half, and then to 19. The Columbia Area Action Plan and the Environment and Energy Commission have proposed that the Columbia Water and Light achieve 100% renewable energy by 2035. A coalition of groups, including the League of Women Voters, Columbia Boone County, have advocated to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030. So the question is, do you support Columbia Water and Light working to achieve 100% clean renewable energy by 2030, even if it costs consumers 5% more per month on their utility bill or 10% more per month? Uh, so I do support the the initiative and the effort while also just being realistic in the fact that we are, the city is in contracts and you can't just get out of a contract without having to pay buy that out. So if it would be a matter of we have to push the, de push the deadline back versus pushing the cost off on to people who are already struggling to make ends meet, I would say we either need to find alternative funding sources or push the deadline back. Um, that said, um, I'm sorry, what's the second part? Uh, uh, just the, the increased cost to oh, we as consumers. Yeah. Um, I would like to see us, um, I believe by 2025, by the, by the end of 2025, the smart readers or the smart meters should be installed throughout the city. Um, and that was the only thing that was holding up uh, the city from transferring over to uh, like a pay system, which is being re recommended by uh, Renew Missouri. Um, it's a tariff price. It's a, you know, the residents will pay a tariff price instead of uh, an increased price. So they would be kind of basically getting the renewable energy as they were uh, paying their bills. But yes, I would transition to something like uh, the pay system in 2025 when we are actually able to. Robert Trevor, you can save us a lot of time by not having me repeat this question, but your answer to that. Yeah, more watts on the grid. We need to use all city, state, and federal programs to incentivize rooftop solar, wind energy, and uh, all the incentives that we can use to help improve our energy efficient of our housing and, um, and our electric bus system. Uh, this is, it's imperative that we, that we start this, it, which it should have started 20 years ago. Um, once again, I wanna draw, want to make sure that we get joined up with the Grain Belt uh, Initiative to, to get that wind energy coming through Columbia. Um, we need to, as a city, we need to make sure that all the residents know about the opportunities they have to transfer over into more sustainable and uh, green energy initiatives. Thank you. Would you try to sell the increased cost to the customer, the consumer? Well, it's those who can't afford it, but we need to have uh, we need to have equity in this, right? If you can afford it, then. Yes, I think that should happen, but it's it's once you get there, once you insulate your house better, put better windows in, put better doors in, then those cost savings are there for a long time, right? It, it's getting there that's going to cost a lot, but I want to use the federal pro city, state, and federal programs to get there. Lisa Meyer, same question. Yes, um, well, there have been uh, already a lot of programs in place for improving your insulation and windows and rebates and such. Something that I think we need to look at, no matter if we would adopt this or not, is we have got to review the regressive rate with utilities. I think that we need to be objective with that. We're currently hurting growing families and we're hurting our lower income with the way it's currently um, set up. But to say that I have those formulas right here um, would, would, would be dishonest. I'd like to work with their committees on that. Regarding transportation, I'm curious, how many people in this room just in the last month have been on the bus? I have one other person. Mm -hmm. So I'm the going record to show that there was one hand raised yes, for those who yes. are listening. And mine. Have and you guys two. been on the bus in the last? Okay. I've been on the bus 
And I think that we have a lot of room for improvement. And I do believe that there is some real potential there. I saw people of all different ages and stages of life. And that's something that we can work on together. And that includes all of us. Maybe just go for a ride and see what you think. And then we can come together as a community to see if we can make this work. I can't believe that it's already past 10 after 7 that we're supposed to wrap up at 7.15. So we're going to have to uh, rush through some questions here. and We're going to get off the line of thought that we've done. Um, Robert Schreiber, you're first on this. Has to do with the Columbia Police Department. They've been scrutinized recently for police violence, including multiple police-involved shootings. How would you help positively change the police department? Um, I think the Columbia Police Review Board needs to have... Uh, it has to have more teeth, right? We can, it needs to be able to make suggestions and then see those suggestions get implemented. And I'd like to look forward to working with our new chief of police, Jill, in doing so. Lisa Myers, same question to you about the police department. Would you repeat it? Sure. Um, they've been scrutinized recently for police violence, including multiple police involved shootings. Says the questioner, how would you help positively change the police department? Well, full transparency and accountability. Um, I know that they want that and we want that. I think a fantastic example is what they're doing in Las Vegas. That's a model that I think that we could follow and do a beautiful job with. Uh, we all want our community to be safe and we need a fully staffed police department. Another question, how many people here have ever done a ride along with the police? Several. It was eye-opening, wasn't it? We've got some real overworked police. We've got to, look, thank you for all, you, you, you've been there, you've seen it. We've got to do what we can to get a fully staffed police department. We need to do that within three to five years and make this our priority for our city. Lucio Patoy, same question about the Columbia Police Department. How would you help positively change its kind of reputation and how it's um, policing our community? I would start by recommending that they actually look at the recommendations that they're given by community groups that give them reform ideas. Um, that'd be a good place to start. Um, I would say um, maybe take their feelings out of it when they when they get critiques. Um, you 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 have a job that comes with virtually carte blanche to do whatever you want. Um, and in terms of the economics of it, it's one of the best starting salaries that you could get in the city. Uh, starting salary is what fifty seven or fifty seven thousand dollars, and all you have to have is a GED. Um, so I would start with, uh, you know, more stringent qualifications, uh, maybe some post-secondary education, maybe some classes uh, before the, before the fact. Um, I don't know. How about uh, when we send them to training, don't send them to training organizations that are uh, so heavily invested in keeping things exactly the same, the same way that they are. Um, and as far as the Citizen Police Review Board, I don't believe that the one that we have as currently constructed actually can have any enforcement, mechani enforcement mechanisms. And that too, I believe, is by design. So, uh, and, and having a, a Citizen Police Review Board that is not going to just go along with uh, what the police said in the first place. I appreciate all the questions that we've gotten, especially from those who are involved on the Zoom. I'm sorry we won't have time for all of these questions. Some of them are specific for some of our council candidates here and some go beyond actually what I would interpret as the city um, most important voice on these issues, but I'm not downplaying any of those topics. I'll end with this one though. Um, and we'll start with, I think uh, Lisa Meyer is first on this, right? Um, as this is the question there, I think, let's see, if you just ended, that means I started with Robert, so Lisa, as the, this is from the questioner, as the mother of an LGBTQIA plus daughter, will you be supportive of Columbia becoming an LGBTQTIA sanctuary city, a safe place for all? So it's a safe haven, not a sanctuary city. Is it asking if I would support it? It's already in place. I know that the council has already discussed okay. this. I'm just reading what they right. said. How do you feel on that issue? Gotcha. Okay, I think that everybody, no matter who they are, um, should be uh, respected. Um, we have, um, um, whether it's your race, your gender, your gender identity, 
your national origin, we should all feel safe and protected in our community. We should all be loved and respected in our community. So, yes. Lucia Batoy, same question to you. Would you be supportive of Columbia becoming an LGBTQTIA sanctuary city and a safe place for all? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and I would also advocate for um, more stringent uh, regulations and investigations into claims of discrimination based on uh, sexuality or gender or um, anything of that nature. Um, because if we just have a declaration but no enforcement mechanisms, then it's just, it's a head back. So, Robert Schreiber, same question. Absolutely. I have uh, friends and family that are in that community, and I was at the meeting when that was passed. I listened to the testimony, and it was it was heartbreaking at times. But when they when it was passed, there was a lot of joy in the room. But that's not the end of it. I want to reach out to the LGBT community and figure out where they want to go from here, right? And listen to them and see where the city can go um, in addressing their their needs. We're going to go to closing statements now. Each of the candidates will have a minute to wrap up what they want to say, either expand for that minute on what they've already talked about or bring up something new or just do a general comment. So we're going to do reverse of how we did on the opening statements. So Lucio Batoy, please, your final statement. Okay, so um, I didn't get a chance to before, so to specifically address uh, the, the issue of Black infant mortality. Um, I would call for a comprehensive study to analyze the impact of environmental and, occup and occupational exposures on, or on maternal mortality in Colombia. Uh, we also seek to collaborate with local public health institutions, colleges, universities to enhance the curriculum uh, and diversify the workforce to address implicit bias and to improve culturally competent care. Uh, and I would also seek to collaborate with community organizations like the uh, Mid Mobile Black Doula Club because. They literally are doing the work to curb black infant, mort black infant mortality, so they could use some support. Uh, and long story short, I'm doing this because this would literally be my full-time job. Like, I don't do this as some vanity project or some hobby or just because I had the spare time and the spare money. Uh, I'm doing this because of the material conditions of the people and the material con of the conditions of the people's stake. Um, and I think that we need to stop playing nice about the people that are standing in the way of progress. All right, Lucy Latoy, thank you. Lisa Meyer, your closing statement. Yes, thank you. I appreciate everyone giving me the opportunity to be here. I based my forum on conversations with residents in the ward, those who rent, those who own. And it came down to three major issues, not all, but most fit under the category of safety, infrastructure, health, and well being. I also know that many people here in the room don't live in Ward 2, so I don't want it to seem like I'm being completely myopic. The decisions that we make as council members should impact our ward, but it also impacts Columbia as a whole, and I'll take that into consideration. It is my hope to bridge this very big gap between the regular people and what's happening at City Hall. I am committed to doing this and bringing people together. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, thank you. Robert Schreiber, your closing comment. I've been a blue collar worker all my life and that's who I want to represent in the second ward. And I think there's a lot of families and regular workers in the second ward that need a voice on the city council. Um, and all the issues that I've been talking about resonate with people when I'm knocking doors. So I want to be a voice and I, I want to do the best I can for the for the city to get us into the future. Thank you. After the votes are tallied, there will be a new city council rep in Ward 2. We know that. We don't know which of these three it will be. Two names will be on the ballot. One would be a write-in. We thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. And I have a hand for them as we're taking a break. And we come back and we'll be talking about the school board. Thank you. Thank you.
for those who are listening on KFPN or KFRU, and for those who are participating through the Zoom, we'll let you know that we have a very nice crowd today. I'm not good at estimating crowd sizes, but as you might be able to hear in the background, it is nearly a full room. So we appreciate everybody's concern and interest in showing up tonight. We just heard from the candidates for ward number two. We're getting ready now to go into our conversation with the school board candidates. The school board has seven members. The Missouri School Board Association provides the following information on candidate qualifications and the role of a school board. The Board of Education is a volunteer representative body elected by the registered voters of the local public school district. A candidate must be a U.S. citizen, resident, taxpayer of the district, a resident of Missouri for at least one year and at least 24 years old, must be current on state and local taxes and not be registered or required to register as a sex offender. The school board governs the school district and provides leadership and advocacy for public education. School boards are charged with making decisions in the best interest of the entire district. The board then establishes the goal and vision of the district with input from the community and evaluates the results. The board develops and approves rules to help schools operate for student success. The board hires and evaluates the superintendent. The board approves the budget proposed by the superintendent and ensures funding supports district goals. And the board shares district information with local legislators and the community to secure resources necessary for student success. There are three candidates running for two open positions. Each candidate uh, will have two minutes to offer an opening statement and a minute closing statement. Candidates are going to be asked questions provided by the League of Women Voters and from public high school students who I'll introduce in a moment. We invite audience questions as we did in the first part of our um, audience participation to write your questions on note cards or enter them in the Zoom chat. I hope we can get to as many as possible as we just saw though, time goes by quickly. So let's get to the candidates. They're going to be presenting their opening statements in the order they will appear on the ballot. Jean Snodgrass, welcome, and we'll hear your opening comments. Great, my name is Jean Snodgrass. I currently serve as the Vice President of the Board of Education, finishing up my first term on the board, and I hope you will um, give me the privilege of being able to serve for a second term. I am running because I believe in our public schools. I'm a huge advocate for our public schools. I think they are a community resource, and I think that they need additional support. I think we have good public schools in Columbia, and I think they can be a lot better. We know that there are issues. We know that there are things that we need to work on. And we've started to address some of those. And we know that there are some that we haven't gotten to yet. We have a really large district, nearly 19,000 students, close to 3,000 employees. That's teachers, administrators, staff. Any change is going to take a little bit of time. We know that. And we also know that it's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for my kids. I have two kids currently in the Columbia Public Schools and one who graduated just last year who's currently a freshman at Mizzou. This is a community resource and we can make it something that really shines in our community and we are on our way to being able to do that. And I really wanna be part of continuing that work and making sure that our public schools are here for our current students, for our next generation of students, and that it provides us with folks that are going on to be really great contributing members of our community. Thank you. Jean Snodgrass, thank you. Second candidate is Alvin Commons. We're welcoming you and also like to hear your opening comments. Hi, uh, my name is Alvin Commons and I'm also a candidate for uh, school board. Uh, I bring an optimistic uh, attitude to everything that I do. And I have been, uh, in Columbia, back here, uh, where I got my high school education at Hickman and at Columbia College, and also graduated from the university. I'm an avid community volunteer. And one of the reasons I am uh, running for the board is because of my optimistic attitude. And I do believe that Columbia Public Schools is one of the best schools simply because me and all of my children went through Columbia Public Schools. And we didn't turn out so bad. <laughs> but right now, it's really important uh, that I stand in that gap, that I listen, and I learn, 
and I try to bring people together. And I do not see problems as problems. I see them as opportunities. And I want to bring people together to bridge that gap so that we can all address those issues with an optimistic attitude. And, re and on the resolving part about it is together when we resolve, we all come out much better. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is to bring together teachers, students, parents, grandparents, community advocates, administrators. And it's through that process that together that we can all make a difference. And in that difference, we will make sure that Columbia Public School continues to be a very strong, vibrant, and successful district. Together, we can make a difference. Thank you. Alan Powers, thank you. Our third candidate is John Thomas Potter. Welcome, glad to have you here. Your opening statements, please. Uh, yes, I'm John Potter. I ran for school board last year. I have, um, unsuccessfully, <laughs> um, I, I have three kids in our school district, one in elementary, one in middle school, and one in high school. Um, I originally got involved in the district uh, about four years ago during the shutdowns. Um, during that time, I uh, advocated for the uh, schools to reopen, being that we were um, one of the last districts in the state to, to open, and we were or in central Missouri. Um, and I just I knew growing up from a uh, single parent household, low income neighborhoods, uh, African American community, that people were struggling. Um, I had to come home from work, lost half our income um, to teach our kids on Zoom. And, and through that process, um, developed a lot of good relationships with um, parents, um, community members across the, the city and, and, uh, and advocated for the schools to open. Once they did open, um, I started a, a transparency and accountability group, which um, really focused on a lot of the issues that were going on in the district that just weren't being talked about. And um, it's, a, it's a platform for a lot of uh, people, uh, community members, staff of CPS, parents to um, come and just uh, let their stories be heard and have um, dialogue with uh, everybody in the community. It's a, a public forum and it's really provided a, a place for a lot of community members to to gather and just really figure out what's going on in the district. Um, I'm running this time to really focus on academic performance and behavioral issues in the district and, and really want to bring up them academic scores and uh, bring down behavioral issues in the district. So um, we can provide a working a learning environment for all students and and give students the, the best education possible. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to a question. I want to start with a question from the league, and then we're going to move to questions from the high school students who are here. And we'll start with Gene Snodgrass on this. A minute to answer the question. What is the role of a classroom teacher? Um, classroom teacher probably gets into it because they want to teach. They love the subject. They love working with kids. Um, I think nowadays, they probably also are required to be part social worker, part behavior specialist. And I know that that's not what many of our teachers got into the profession to do. And I think one of the things that we want to really work on that I've heard, I know from, from I think all of us that are sitting up here at various forums and current board members and administration, is we really want to see teachers get back to being able to focus on teaching because that's how our students are gonna get the most out of it and that's how they're gonna be able to raise their own achievement. We want the environment to be safe. We want people to feel really comfortable and really committed to that inquiry so that they can develop critical thinking skills and so that our teachers can enjoy coming into work and doing what they do best, which is to teach our young folks. All right, thank you. Alvin Coven, same question to you. What is the role of a classroom teacher? Well, first of all, I have the most respect for our teachers and what they go through and how successful they are and for what they're being paid. Um, but much love and much respect. And I will answer that question by saying this. I once 
the ABE program for adults. And the most important thing was to find the topics, the curriculum, and ingest something into that curriculum that was exciting for the students. And they wanted to learn. It was an AB program. And I took it, I was in a public housing community, predominantly African-Americans. And I intuited into each subject taught an Af African-American overture to it. And most of those adults, they were excited, they attended, and they succeeded. And the only one that didn't succeed was because of me. I did not know that they could not, they could read, but I did not pick up on the comprehension. And that still haunts me today because had I picked up on it, the success rate would have been complete. So I have the most respect and they should teach according to what the children and the folks need. Thank you. John Otter, your answer to the question, what is the role of a classroom teacher? Um, yes, uh, the role of a classroom teacher in a Columbia uh, public school um, is, is to educate and to teach. Um, one of the things that I've been running on is that the teachers are really um, boggled down by uh, doing a lot of other things. Uh, Snodgrass, I mentioned a few of them. Another one is, you know, playing phone police. I've uh, advocated for a district-wide uh, phone policy in order to uh, take that burden off the teachers. And so we can provide that um, educational environment that all, all students need. And so they can really focus on what they initially um, came to uh, the education um, process to do, and that's to teach and to provide a, a safe environment for the students and a comfortable environment for the students. And I think that's all tied into to that educational environment. And um, they're, they just got too many hats that they have to wear right now. And we need to, we really need to uh, district at the district level, take uh, take those hats off so they can wear one. And that's the teacher's hat and, and provide that best education possible for our students. Thank you. you answered one of the part of one of the questions handed in from one of our audience members. And I've been at another one of the forums and I've read the uh, newspaper accounts of other forums. So we know where you stand on the cell phone policy. I'm going to ask the other two candidates. Where do you stand on cell phone policy in the classroom, Alvin Cobb? The cell phone policies, I don't think that there is a place for them within the classroom unless and they are doing a lesson or something where they are required to use the cell phones. But right now, I, I just don't think that there is a place for them because in the classrooms, the ones that I have visited now, uh, they are really tricky with the cell phones. <laughs> cell phones are down here and, and the teachers are teaching and they're playing games. Uh, and again, the thing is, is that we as a board, we have to establish policies district-wide to address that issue. And we have to bring everybody together to come up which is the best policy. And, and, and hold everybody accountable, the teacher accountable, the student accountable, the whole district should be accountable. And that with that policy in place, uh, then we can move forward. Jean Snodgrass, where do you fall on cell phones in classrooms? Um, so first, I wanna clarify, like I did at the Retired Teachers Forum, I'm not being sneaky, I'm timing, so it's all amusing. Um, it's not playing. But, but, yeah. I do think that the really important thing is that we want distraction-free classrooms. That's for the teachers, that's for the students, because the student using the cell phone isn't always the only one being distracted. I think that also our folks that are in the classrooms are best positioned to determine what is going to work or what isn't going to work in those situations. And I think it's also important that whatever is established be consistent across the district so that at the very least at each level. So it might not be that all the high schools and all the elementary schools are doing the same thing, but all, all of our high schools should have the same procedures and policies in place, all of our middle schools, so that it's equitable across the district. And I hope that our teachers and our administrators and also with input from our students can find something that works. It's been good to stand up here and see the reaction of three of our audience members who are 
particularly interested in the answer about what a teacher does and also about cell phones in the classroom. And they have been really locked in. So it's a very much my, uh, my privilege right now to welcome them one at a time. These are students who are members of the League of Women Voters, Columbia Boone County Youth Voters Advisory Board. I'm told there are about 15 or so that are very active in this. These three students happen to be seniors at Hickman High School, but the board is open to students at all high schools. So Olivia Watts, front and center, please. And I'm going to have to borrow this microphone. <laughs> Hold this really close and people will hear you real well. And then I'll ask a sharing of those two microphones. Olivia, what the, I would love to ask you what your thoughts were about their answers, but that's not the purpose of the forum. <laughs> all right. Uh, I am going to be asking you this question. Um, about the understaffing of teachers. So in January of 2024, about 59,000 teachers and other educational staff quit their jobs in the United States, which makes this the highest number since the COVID-19 pandemic. Teachers are quitting at an alarming rate and their replacements are not being trained or hired. There's also a severe lack of support staff in schools. Cleanliness is suffering due to a lack of janitorial staff and teachers are having to manage multiple classes because there are so little sub substitutes. Every student has had an experience in which their learning experience has been disrupted due to understaffing. In one case, which I know from an anecdote from a friend, an underqualified substitute was called to teach biology for an entire semester because of the teacher quitting the year. What is your plan to increase qualified teachers and support staff while retaining current personnel? We'll start with Alvin Cummins because we're trying to alternate who goes first. Is that all right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, First of all, uh, much respect to the teachers, and uh, they have a very difficult job. And uh, the, the teachers that I've talked to and that I have been working with over the past few years are just amazing. They are amazing. And yes, you are right. They are under a lot of pressure, overcrowdedness. Uh, the issues that we have in the schools, uh, the disciplinary issues, uh, having classrooms uh, overcrowded and disruptions all during the day. We, as the board, we have to get a hold of that issue and we have to rectify it. We got to make it, we've got to make the schools safe, clean, and we got to clear that environment so that teachers can do what they are supposed to do. It is to teach. And it, we're just a little ways away, but we still have to work and come together and figure out exactly how we're going to get it back to where it should be. Thanks. John Potter? Yes, um, the, uh, the, the local teachers union, both of them um, did surveys here recently and the number one and number two issues were uh, behavior issue and teachers pay. I think that um, this, when it comes to teachers pay, I think we need to be competitive um, with other uh, surrounding districts and be, you know, at the top um, um, in pay scale. I think, um, I think here in Columbia, we are privileged, you know, with, uh, with our community and the, uh, the amount of, um, money that that is available to our students and so i think we really need to focus on um giving some of that money to teachers so we can retain good teachers the other one is behavioral issues um like i said teachers uh, want to come to teach they don't want to be security guards they don't want to be breaking up fights they don't want to be uh psychiatrists um they they want to teach and so we have to provide a safe environment for them um, there's a lot of stories that I hear on the Transparency and Accountability Group that um, would, would shock you that the teachers have to go through. And so um, that's that's one of the reasons why they're leaving. Thank you. Gene Stoddard, right? So I think many of the things that my uh, running name, I'm not sure that's the right term, um, have noted, but I think also really important to note that there are things that the district is starting to do and, and can continue to do. Um, retain, retention and recruitment is really big. And also part of that is making sure that our teachers feel valued. If that includes salary, that also includes supports. That's are there additional supports in the classrooms? So that means raising not only teacher pay, but making sure that our parents and our other assistants also have competitive wages so that folks want to come and fill those positions. 
It also means that our teachers need to have access to good professional development. It means that our teachers need to know what they can do and what they can't do in the classroom. And we need to have consistent discipline across the buildings because as we've said, we want our teachers to be able to teach and to feel valued so that they stay and become more experienced teachers in our classroom. I'm not gonna ask you if you like their answers or not, but do you have anything else you want to follow up with? Are you okay? All right, thank you. That was uh, Olivia Watts. Thank you so much for putting together an excellent question and you can tell that they have done their uh, work on this. So next up would be Penelope Heidi. Welcome. And again, close is good. All right, I'm Penelope Heidi, a student at Hickman. And um, a question I have is in the current climate, school shootings and gun violence are some of the most hot button issues. Since 1970, there have been 2,331 school shootings in the United States, with nearly a fifth of that number occurring in 2020 and 2022 alone. As schools have adapted to try and combat this unique and terrifying threat, students are scared to go to school and parents are scared to send them. What measures will you take to create an environment where kids feel safe to learn without fear of gun violence? We'll start with John Potter. It's his turn to go first on this. Yes, I would um, I would uh, team up with the local police department. I know the, 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 lo the school district already has uh, SROs, but I think we need more of them. Um, I also would a, a, adopt a, a plan for um, staff members to be able to uh, conceal and carry. Um, the only thing that's going to stop a gun is a gun. And if it's okay to guard the board members, I've been to a lot of school board meetings, and they have armed officers and, un, and normal clothes officers that I'm sure are conceal and carrying, guarding them, protecting them. So if we protect our board members like that, we should protect our students like that. The last thing, the worst thing you can see on a school is a gun-free zone. Um, it's a deterrent. Um, we have to deter this violence. You're not going to have, you're less likely to have somebody come into the district with a gun if they know other guns are there. Yeah. Gene Snodgrass, uh, and, and if you need to uh, our students repeat any part of this for now, they will. Um, one, I just want to say that I I would disagree with Mr. Potter about the need for teachers or those that are not um, certified law enforcement to be carrying weapons in our schools. I think one of the things that we can do, though, is to make sure, one, that taking steps to, which already is done in some cases, to control entry into the buildings, the district right now is looking at new visitor information systems, which will make it easier to check background checks when folks are coming to work within the schools. Also looking at systems that can detect weapons entering. We also know that one of the really important things and the way that uh, weapons have been found in the schools when it has occurred is often because somebody says something. And so we need to make sure that our students and our community know who the right contacts are and that they feel comfortable coming forward and saying something. And we need to address some of the things that are happening outside the schools where violence is coming into the schools. And that's a full community effort. Alvin Cobbins will need a microphone and uh, his answer to this question. Uh, folks, I am sorry. I could never, ever agree with teachers and everybody else carrying a gun inside a school district, inside a facility with one of my children at that school. That would take away so much money in order to train a teacher in a firearm. Mm. Okay, so basically what I would recommend is that we train and teach our children very early on how to read and comprehend. And a part of reading and writing and learning how to comprehend is discipline, leadership, success. 
so that if we have those things as they progress on to the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth grade, it will eliminate some of the attitudes and the problems that we're having within our hallways and in our bathrooms, in our school. So I would take a different approach rather than to fight fire with fire. Thank you. That will be satisfied. Thank you very much. And that will be Heidi from uh, Hickman with our question. And now we have one more from another one of the uh, students. And this is Allison Hall. Welcome. Your question. Missouri schools have made national headlines for banning books. Over 300 in the 2022-2023 school year, according to a report by PEN America. The Bluest Eye by Pulitzer Prize winner Toni Morrison is one such book, which was removed from schools in Winsville, Missouri for three months before the ban was rescinded following a lawsuit brought forth by the American Civil Liberties Union of Missouri on behalf of a group of students. If the concerned parent of a CPS student contacted you regarding the banning of this book or any other, what would your response be? Gene Snodgrass is first on this one. Aren't you glad the student came up with the easy questions? Um, I'm going to say that that actually is relatively easy because I, I don't think we should be banning books. I don't think that's the role of the school board. I think that we need all of our students and all of our community to have access to a variety of information and to be able to hear and see and read about different perspectives and different life experiences. I think that we have media specialists. Obviously, we need books to be age appropriate, right? But that is very different than talking about banning the book. We have really amazing teachers, really amazing media specialists. This is their job. They know what is supposed to be in there. We're following the law. We know we have all the books that are in our libraries right now. They showcase a variety of different ways that folks live their lives in a variety of different cultures, a variety of things that you can do. That's really important. That's part of exposing students um, to what's going on in the world and making them ready to participate in our society. And so I think it's relatively easy to say we shouldn't be banning books. Alvin Coppin, same question. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. And, and I do agree with Jane on that banning the books. But I do have a question that I would like to ask. Beware of wolf and sheep clothing. The folks that are banning the books, look at who they are. Look at who they are. Did, did our librarians have anything to do with who, who was banning the books? Did our educators have anything to do with who's banning those books? Folks, it is a political football that has no place in public schools. So uh, yeah, there are certain books that should be, like James said, is age appropriate. I get that part, but to take all of our books out just because you have an a issue, personal issue with them, that's a no. So I'm not in favor of banning the books unless we are a part of that process to make that decision. We have to be. If not, the answer is no. John Potter? Yes, um, I don't agree in banning books. Um, I think that books should be age appropriate. I think if um, and and um, and uh, and and as far as foul language, I think it should be appropriate too. You know, if it can't be said on the radio, then it, then um, it needs to be uh, age appropriate. Just like a movie, just like um, guidelines on radios, TV shows, uh, the news. Um, if it can be shown on the news, then then it's probably uh, age appropriate for high schoolers or whatever. So um it's all about age appropriateness i i don't think there's uh, any topics that um that uh especially high school students um can't handle as long as it's uh, appropriate appropriate no graphic language and um and and graphic images so um i think that uh banning the books is uh, i'm not for it it's just um uh, it needs to be age appropriate you know it's just like a movie if it's rated r it's not banned just uh, not appropriate for um, for a certain age group. Thanks. Thank you. How about a hand for our uh, students, please? I want to encourage those three and, and others like them 
to continue to be involved, continue to be thinking, and to uh, continue to put your uh, mind to what it is that you want to see us adults do and hope that we do. And maybe sometime in the future, we'll have a forum before the candidates say they're going to run. And we'll ask all the high school students in part of that forum, what do you think is important? What do you want to see in the school board? Not that that should be the defining, but it would be an interesting voice to hear. We have come to the end of what we have allotted for this time, but uh, we haven't gotten to all the questions and I apologize for that, but I think the uh, student participation was probably the highlight of the night for me. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's have a closing statement. And sorry, Kip Kendrick, and I've already said we've had the highlight and it's not going to be used. Um, we're going to have closing statements at this time, and we'll go in reverse order as what we did with the opening statements. A minute to, to wrap up your thoughts today, John Potter. Uh, yes, uh, let me clarify about the, the gun statement. Uh, there would have to be rigorous, rigorous training. I would say the same training that our law enforcement has. So um, I would agree with what Snodgrass is that you'd have to have uh, law enforcement training to have a gun in the school. So just to clarify that. Um, I think um, we need to provide a safe place for our teachers and our students and staff in Columbia Public Schools. I think um, concentrating on behavioral issues um, would really um, provide that. I think we need to have a, a, a uniform behavioral plan across the district that treats all students equally. And um, in doing that, I think we could really cut down on the behavioral issues. Um, also, our academic performances need to uh, increase. And in order to do that, I think we need to uh, focus on the learning environment in the classroom and and get the get the cell phones, you know, come up with some district wide policy to, to get those um, taken care of, get them out of the classroom. Can't um, learn math if you're on TikTok. Thank you. <laughs> Alan Poppins, please, your closing statement. Folks, I, uh, I grew up in Southeast Missouri and I went to Haytown Negro School for the, from grade one to grade nine. And in that school, everybody knew everybody. My mom knew all of my teachers. My teachers all knew my mom. And we were engaged and our parents were engaged in that school. And my envision is to bring that kind of an optimistic attitude to Columbia Public Schools so that we can get back to a basic foundational principle of the whole community. The whole district is involved with one goal in mind is to provide the best and the most rigorous education for all of our students that's possible so that we can succeed as a district and as a community. That's what I envision. Thank you. Jean Snowgrass, your closing statement, please. Um, I would really love the opportunity to continue to serve on the board because I think that while we know there are things that we still need to work on, we know we're trying to raise academic achievement, we know we're trying to address behavior issues and a lot of these other things, there is progress that is being made and I wanna be part of continuing that progress. Within just the last couple of years, we've added student voice to our board meetings, each board meeting, which is a really important component. We're looking at additional um, things for retention and recruitment of teachers, looking at revamping behavior plans, the board has an opportunity to support these initiatives that are coming from the administration and from the teachers, to hear voices from the community, and to make sure that everybody has the supports and resources that they need so that our teachers can teach and our students can learn, and so that we can raise that achievement and really do something for the benefit of our community. And for that, I'd appreciate your vote on April 2nd. Thank you. And she's not playing games. She's just keeping track of the NCAA first round scores. She's not doing that either. Um, we appreciate this school. Now you'll have a chance to vote if you're in the Columbia Public School District for two out of the three because we're uh, electing two members of the school board and we'll have at least one new member of the school board. 
Thank you very much for being here tonight. Best of luck to all of you. I know it's been a long campaign season. We have one more topic. How many of you already say, I know everything I need to know about the proposition on the ballot that's also okay. going to be? Yeah, I didn't think so. So we'll take a two minute break, change the front, and come back for our last segment. Thank you for continuing to be a part of our forum tonight at the Friends Room of Columbia Public Library. This forum is kind of a tradition as it gets closer to the election day. Again, some of you might be tempted to vote between now and April 2nd. And if you do, um, so be it. But you're going to be better informed by having participated tonight. And thanks to those who are listening on Zoom and also on KFRU and KOPN. So we have... Um, gone to the closing time of the library, but they don't charge you when you bring a book back late, so they're not going to find us for being a little bit late tonight. We'll, we'll spend about, we're talking about 15 minutes on this. Both of our guests are going to have five minutes to present some information that I think all of us will benefit from because, as I said, going into that break, how many of us really feel confident about Proposition 1 on the ballot? I need to hear what they have to say. Here's what the proposition says as it is on the ballot, and it's not very long, what we've got on our sample ballot. Shall the county of Boone exempt senior citizens from certain increases in the property tax liability that's due on such senior citizens' primary residence? Kip Kendrick is here. He is our Boone County presiding commissioner. And Cherie Tolson Rice, who is Missouri State Representative of the 44th District, and they are each going to be given five minutes to make a presentation to help us flesh out what this means. And then we'll see if we have some time for some questions also. Kip Kendrick, welcome, and please help us learn tonight. Great, thank you. And that's what I'll be doing. I'm not gonna be I, in my official position. I can't speak in support or opposition to Prop 1. I can present information. So Proposition 1, as, as David read it, uh, will appear on the ballot on the April 2nd ballot. Early voting, no excuse absentee voting is already underway. Uh, this came about, and the language uh, came about as a result of Senate Bill 190. Senate Bill 190 was passed into law. This last legislative session was signed, became effective August 28, 2023. Shortly after that, Missouri Association of Counties, Boone County included, uh, saw several drafting errors in the legislation, um, and one of those addressed. And, and those are being addressed at this time. In fact, the bill sponsor of uh, Senate Bill 190 filed cleanup legislation on the Senate side. Um, and so kind of where it stands right now, the commission 
felt like we didn't have enough information with the vast majority of counties. At this point, only 10 counties have moved forward with implementing. There's 114 counties, including the city of St. Louis in the state of Missouri who can implement this. And so uh, there are a lot of counties who, who are not moving forward at this time. And of those 10 counties who have adopted, not all 10 counties have actually implemented the program. Several of them have adopted it, but are taking a wait and see to see what kind of cleanup legislation works its way through the General Assembly. Um, the County Executive uh, Elman uh, from St. Charles County called uh, Senate Bill 190 a half, half-baked pie. Uh, but like with any pie, as it stays in the oven a little bit longer, it starts to take shape and you say, uh, you know, I think that's I think that's getting close to ready to come out. And that's how the that's how the commission felt. Uh, by placing this on the ballot, we know that Senate leadership, House leadership wanted to see that cleanup language move through. And we felt like this is an appropriate time to place it on the April 2nd ballot in order for that to be part of the dialogue, part of the conversation. Now, it will impact senior citizens' primary residency. And so those who qualify would, would basically see their property tax frozen at that current rate if you're a senior citizen. Um, there's been some misinformation going around that Boone County Commission would seek to exempt or, or carve out certain taxing jurisdictions. That's absolutely not the case. Uh, we have in, we have uh, spoken to, and all the taxing jurisdictions know that they will be impacted by this. So the school districts, your library districts, your fire districts, all those taxing jurisdictions within uh, Boone County uh, within Boone County are going to be in, would be impacted by it. And so from the commission standpoint, if and when it's approved on the April second ballot and prognosticating, I you know without saying support or, or, or against it, you know, I believe we have, we assume that this is going to pass. We will begin the very public process of, of drafting a policy, having a public dialogue, having hearings about what that policy would be before we adopt it, because there's a lot of mechanics yet to work out. And I think that's what a lot of counties are seeing. Uh, we anticipate at least having to hire one staff member, probably two staff members in order to really be able to implement this uh, because it's going to cross multiple offices, right? The assessor's office will have to be involved, collector's office, clerk's office, the commission will have to obviously be engaged in it on adopting the policy. So we're going to uh, have a very public process. And part of that is that, you know, the General Assembly, uh, when they pass this, and when we, I think, all kind of collectively close our eyes and envision who that helps, it's it's lower, moderate income seniors who who are having difficulty paying uh, increased property tax bills or, you know, having difficulty making ends meet. Um, and to that end, uh, you know, the Boone County Commission, I think we want to have a conversation with the public. What does that look like? How do we make sure that those seniors who need it the most get it, while also making sure that we don't do um, a, a potential damage to our taxing jurisdictions, mainly our schools? That's that's who mainly is the big, largest beneficiary of the uh, of property tax, of real property tax. So how do we balance those to make sure the seniors who need it the most get it, while also making sure it doesn't necessarily harm, do long-term lasting damage to, to school districts across Boone County? Uh, one way that we may consider doing that, this is not an adopted stance, not an adopted position, certainly not a policy. One way we may consider doing that is, is the commission ex may explore a, a policy that would apply to Homestead that pays $300,000 or less as shown on the Boone County assessment file. Again, that's not a policy, that's not adopted stance, but if we looked at that, and it's important to note Boone County assessment file, that's not a commercial appraisal, that is what is on file that we have. 86% of homes in Boone County appraise at $300,000 or less on the Boone County assessment file. So it would be a very generous program but it'd be a way to potentially make sure that seniors could get it uh, while also not negatively impacting the school districts, the fire districts moving forward long-term. And so that'll be part of the conversation for sure, for, for sure. And after April 2nd, we look forward to a very public process on making sure that we can implement a program that works for everyone. Thank you. Marie Tolson Wright, we appreciate you being here tonight and we'd like to hear your um, comments about this proposition. Thank you. The Senate Bill one, uh, 
190 went into effect August 28th. And so I didn't believe that the county commission would vote to uh, do the freeze. And so I went ahead and started the initiative petition process. In the law that is on the books now, there's two pathways. A county commission can vote to do it. As of last week, I believe there are up to 13 or 14 counties that have already implemented this. Uh, the other way was if the county commission took no action, a citizen initiative petition could force the commission to put it on the ballot. Um, based on the 2020 election, I have to gather 4,600 signatures. I'm getting close to that number. I don't anticipate it probably not being on the August ballot, but it will be on the November ballot. What isn't in the law, I did not see any authority in there that gave the county commission the authority to spend taxpayers' money to put it on the ballot. I have a neighbor a quarter mile from my house and in uh, outside of Hallsville, that's the only issue on the ballot. So they are wasting your taxpayers' dollars when they're elected to make that decision. They came out with a press release in November that said, we're gonna take a wait and see approach. There is a bill in the House and the Senate. It looks like it will get passed in one of the two versions to clarify any gray areas. And if it's passed, there will be no appraised value limit of 300,000 or what Jackson County has done is 450,000. I had a woman come into my office today. She didn't know how to look up what her house was valued at. I went to Show Me Boone. It's valued at 305,000. So she's gonna miss the threshold by $5,000. Number two, um, it, it's, it's wasting your tax dollars just by being on the ballot. Um, they could have done it. I'm gonna look at my notes here real quick. I did a, a complete uh, synopsis of this on my Tuesday's Facebook page. Their ballot language says certain. Well, what is certain taxes? My ballot language says all taxes. Now Kip just said, well, we won't carve out that that's a misnomer. Green County did carve out. They only froze the county taxes. So if it passes or whether it fails, my petition will go forward one way or the other. And if mine passes in November, it will supersede and override whatever the commission decides. What I didn't like is their November wait and see approach changed the end of February when all of a sudden out of nowhere, they're putting it on the April ballot. But then they said, but we'll hold public hearings and see what the people want. But now they've already decided 300,000 without holding public hearings. They could have been holding public hearings since last fall. They could have been holding public hearings and actually had a plan on the April ballot. So people know what they're going to do, but they don't even have to put it on the ballot. So again, it's a waste of your money. KIPP is very good at wasting the taxpayer's money. It's not the first time and it will continue. Um, we need to help our senior citizens. The SS valuation in Boone County has gone up 16% in the last two years. People are being priced out of their home. Now, I don't know where they came up with 300,000, but according to the Columbia Board of Realtors, the median average house price in Columbia is 450,000. So if that's the middle price of a house, why didn't they go 450,000? That's what Jackson County did. Um, so anyway, here's what I'm telling people. The bottom line is vote yes on theirs. Let's take and see what they may or may not do. And again, an April ballot has a low voter turnout. What are we going to have? Maybe 10, 12 percent. Whereas the November ballot will probably have a 70, 75 percent voter turnout. So no matter what happens in April, I'm moving forward to help senior citizens. And at the legislative level, we hope to clarify any gray areas or question marks in the law to make it crystal clear. There will be no threshold limits and to make sure that anyone on retirement, social security teachers, and it's not gonna hurt the schools or any other public entity, they won't lose a penny. This is just a freeze on any future tax increases. Columbia Public Schools has 88 million in reserves and they're not even investing it enough to get a return on interest. So again, vote yes on the counties and in April and vote yes on mine in November. And we need to help our senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you a, a question, a follow-up question on this. So how will the ballot language look differently 
when you get something on the November ballot. So I have the language, and it's in. Uh, if anybody here tonight wants to sign my petition, if anybody wants to gather petition signatures, I have it with me, and I will read it to you. Shall the County of Boone, Missouri, exempt senior citizens from increases in the property tax liability to all of the taxing authorities due on such senior citizens' primary residence? There says certain. Property taxes are property taxes on your real estate. We are not talking personal property. So why is there's just certain taxes? Does that leave the door open that they can maybe freeze some, but not all? Mine will freeze all on any future increases. Political subdivisions, taxing entities will not lose a penny. Because this is not going to affect what is paid now. It will not go down. Your taxes will not go down a penny and the entities won't lose a penny. They will just not reap any future increases that they put before the voters on taxes. If you meet the threshold of 62 or older and live in your own home, and according to the 2020 census, uh, this would be about less than 10% of people in Boone County are over 62, and we don't know of that less than 10% how many live in their own home, but I can tell you it's a voluntary opt-in program if you don't want to take the freeze and you meet the qualifications, you can pay the increase. And in fact, you can pay all the taxes you want and get your checkbook out right now. Kendrick, let me ask you the question about the inclusion of the of the term certain increases. Help us to understand that. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, one one ad word uh, one word added to what was allowed by uh, Senate Bill 190, and so that we felt that was important because we know that we believe that there's going to be clarification that's coming from the General Assembly on on taxes such as the blind pension fund. Now, if we just said all taxes, blind pension fund would be included in that. That is technically a constitutional requirement that that be funded. And so we don't believe we have the authority to do that. We also have to have a conversation about bond indebtedness. Do we, do we include bond indebtedness in this? Because when people, when people voted on the bonds and, and the actuaries ran the numbers, they were looking at future increases as well in order to be able to pay down that debt. And so how, how are we going to factor that in? And so we felt that it was important for us to be able to put that cert word certain in, in order to have a conversation on bond indebtedness and the blind pension fund. Now, I will say also, as I said before, the 300,000, that is a starting point of the conversation. That's not, that's not a decision that's been made. That I want to be very transparent with everyone that that is a conversation that's happening. And, and we are happy to adjust that based on feedback that we get. It is important though, that we, we have a conversation about what this balance means. For Columbia Public Schools, Columbia Public Schools will lose out a, a greater real dollar amount than anyone else. But for when you talk about Sturgeon or Harrisburg, their population in those taxing jurisdictions skews significantly older than the city of Columbia. And their schools will have a, less real dollar amount, but a higher percentage of their base eroded by a potential freeze if it went to everyone. And that's not so that's not to say that seniors don't deserve it. it, it they do. And we will make sure that we set up a deliberate program that gets help to seniors who need it, while also making sure that we're protecting that Harrisburg school district that already has gone to four days of school, four days a week school, and is having a very difficult time paying their teachers in order to even remain at a four day school level, right? This is, we're, we're being a little bit slow about this. We're being cautious about this. I understand that people want us to move a little bit faster, but people elect us to take governance seriously at the Boone County Commission level. We have to be deliberate about this in order to make sure that we're protecting everyone, the seniors who need it, and also the school districts, the fire districts, the ambulance districts who rely on that tax revenue in order to provide a basic service, a basic function to all of society. Let me ask you this. Uh, let's say that I, I have a spouse that is not a senior citizen. How do you define senior citizen? Well, so I, I, in, the, in the current legislation, a senior is defined by someone receiving Social Security benefits. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to seek clarification, because Social Security benefits retired teachers don't receive social security. And so if we look at it at a plain letter reading like Missouri does with any law, 
it would actually exempt uh, many first responders and many of most teachers who do not pay into and receive social security. And so there's a debate moving forward and, and that potential will be defined in the law moving forward, the cleanup legislation. Um, but it may also be impacted just yesterday I saw the Republican House caucus in Congress uh, it proposed an idea of raising the retirement uh, age in, in their proposal. And, and so what happens if it is tied to Social Security age and then federal government raises it? So, you know, we, we hope that there is a, a real age amount, that there is a that there's a hard line put in state law. But so we're, we're I, looking at the General Assembly for clarification on that. So what I started to ask was, if you have a household where one is receiving Social Security and one is not, not old enough to do it, what happens then? My understanding, and I've been working with an organization, as have a lot of other counties throughout the state, that as long as one spouse and, and is, we, the current Social Security age is 62. And um, I, we take it that... Um, that's age eligible. And so we don't believe number one, it's exempting any teacher retirement or any other kind of retirement. So the answer is yes, they would qualify. I think I, I'm not trying to speak for people in this audience, but I think as a voter, I would be torn on this. I'm just speaking from not the background that either one of you have, but I think we look at this and say, you know, if I'm retired, I'm well past social security age. so. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, I like the idea of, of having my taxes frozen on property. But then I also like the idea of funding the schools and the library. So I think it's, I think that's the, I think that's on a shallower level than either one of you are. I think that's what we're looking at when we go to the ballot box and look at proposition one. So the answer to that is the amount is gonna be very negligible. If you think of the older population on how many people in your neighborhood, your community, your family, your friends are in nursing homes, retired living, assisted living. And this does not apply to anybody that rents. This only applies to homeowners. And again, if you qualify for the program and you're worried and have a concern about it, you do not have to take the freeze on future increases. Your taxes won't go down. You will not be paying less. It's just you would not be paying any future increases. And almost every increase has to go before the voters to be approved by the voters. So again, it's so negligible, but I think it helps the most vulnerable who get a monthly check, whether it's social security or retirement, that little bit might make the difference. And, and like this lady uh, came to me today, her house is worth 305,000. She could barely scrape up paying the taxes that were due December 31st. Her insurance has gone up food, utilities, she's barely making it. And to her, this one person in Boone County, it could make a lot of difference. Kim Kendrick, a final yeah. thought on this, please. Yeah, it, I, I'm glad that Representative uh, pointed out that you can, you know, if you're a senior, especially, you can kind of almost vote twice on this. So if it passes uh, and it becomes law and you have a concern with it, you don't have to sign up with it. It will be an application process. It will be an opt-in. Um, we're going to be very deliberate about how we move forward and proceed with this, and we have been because we wanna make sure that we, again, we can we can have a program that works well. Uh, we can work out the kinks of it, uh, that we can we can implement for those seniors who need it, uh, while also making sure that we're, we're cognizant of, uh, of what the impact may be for taxing jurisdictions. And we'll likely set, or at least have a conversation, do we set a renewal period on it? Do we, do we look, uh, do we kind of have a, a four or five year time set where we, where we have to renew it in order to continue to move it forward? So we can make sure we can gather all that information making sure it's working for seniors, making sure it's working for everyone else. And uh, it, it's a complicated issue. Ad valorem taxes is, is, is complicated. The more I learn about it, uh, the less I feel I know at times uh, because you, you do it. Uh, we're, we're all paying into it and we're all, we all reap the benefits of a, a well-functioning schools and, 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 and a, a fire district that, that responds to, to our homes uh, in their time of greatest needs. And, uh, and so there is, it's, it's a balance. It, it certainly is, and 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 the commission is is uh, promises you. I promise you today uh, that we will work to strike that balance uh, for seniors and and to make sure that we're doing all we can to protect the tax jurisdictions moving forward. We didn't ask for this responsibility when the general assembly dropped this in our lap. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! We got a lot of other things going on. It's taken up a lot of time and attention, but it it is taking up that time and attention because it's a critical issue.
it's important that we get this right and and we uh promise you that we'll do our best to get it right thank you thank you both for being here i appreciate that and the audience i want to uh, let me go to the closing here this concludes tonight's candidate and ballot issues forum league of women voters thanks all the candidates and the crowd here and listening to us ballot issues and the speakers community members for participating it has been this forum has been recorded It'll be posted on the league and the library websites. Thanks to Lauren Williams again and her tech crew, KFRU, with Tom Holmes in the back, running the items to make it so that we can be on the radio there and KOPN for broadcasting the form. There is a voter's guide that the league always does that's very helpful for the upcoming election, for the contested races, for Ward 1 recall, and the ballot issues information. And it is available on their website at lwecbc.org. No excuse absentee voting began on March 19th and continued through April 1st at the Boone County Clerk's Office. Missouri requires that you have an unexpired Missouri driver's license or non-driver's license, unexpired U.S. passport, or other federal ID to vote during no excuse absentee voting. If you do not have an acceptable photo ID, you can still vote on election day with a blue provisional ballot, we encourage you to vote. Thank you all for being here and have a good night.